thank you all very much for coming along. Uh, my name is Ian Robinson. I'm an engineer at NEO here in London. Um, for the last couple of years, I've been working on some of our testing infrastructure, the infrastructure that we use for testing Neo4j, uh, in particular for testing the clustered version of Neo4j. And more recently, uh, I've been working with a team here in London to build some of our data integration tooling. But today, I'm going to be talking about moving graphs to production. That's effectively moving your application, your Neo4j-based application, into production, and how we can plan for that and then actually execute on that. So some of the things that we're looking at over the next half an hour, uh, some of the solution architectures options uh, available to you, um, and some of the hardware and software requirements that you'll need to take account of when you're planning for those kind of production environments. We'll look at the HA architecture, how that works, and some of the tuning and configuration options there. And then we'll look at some of the uh, operational issues that you want to take account of, things such as backups and monitoring and then finally, I'll talk briefly about some of the testing strategies that you might employ. Okay. So you're planning to build a Neo4j-based application, and finally, it's destined for production. So one of the first things that you're going to have to think about is the kind of solutions architecture that you're going to adopt. This is effectively how are you going to incorporate Neo4j into your application. And there are several options available to you. Uh, you can use the server version of Neo4j, you can use the server together with store procedures, or you can use Neo4j as an embedded graph database and host it in your own Java process. So I'll briefly just summarize those three different options. So the server version, this is the, the way in which the majority of people use Neo4j today. Um, it's a server-based product. We've built the server infrastructure based on uh, Jetty that surrounds an embedded graph database instance. So inside of each server, there is an embedded graph database that's making all of that data durable on disk. And then we've created a server infrastructure that surrounds it that allows you to locate that, that instance somewhere on the network. So typically, you'll, you'll, uh, you'll speak to that, that instance or to a cluster of instances by way of a driver. And as Emil mentioned in the keynote this morning, and as some of you may have uh, seen this afternoon if you were here at Mark and Stefan's talk, we now have a unified set of drivers and a new binary protocol that allow you to communicate with that server, effectively exchange Cypher over this binary protocol to communicate with the server. And we supply drivers with 3.0. We supply a new set of drivers for Java and .NET, Python, and JavaScript. And there are more drivers coming in the future. Okay. So this is the, the, the most common setup nowadays to have your application, your application code, um, incorporating one of those drivers, and then most likely executing Cypher statements against the Neo4j cluster over that binary bro uh, bolt protocol. Um, and it's, typically, you'll introduce a load balancer as well so that you can load balance the requests across that cluster. And I'll discuss some of the load balancing issues a little later on in this talk. The second option is to extend that server with stored procedures, or to extend all of the servers in your cluster with stored procedures. And again, this is a new feature that we've introduced with 3.0. But if any of you have used Neo4j previously, um, you'll have known of a, a feature called unmanaged extensions. Uh, stored procedures are effectively those unmanaged extensions plus plus. It basically allows you to write uh, additional code that sits inside of the server and that gives you access to the embedded graph database that's at the heart of that server. Okay? So you can create store procedures, bundle them up in a jar, sit them on the server, and then invoke them via Cypher. So again, those unified drivers, all of those different drivers that we've introduced with 3.0, allow you to invoke a store procedure, and then perhaps to pass the results from that store procedure into another Cypher statement, execute that Cypher statement, take the results from that, pass them into a store procedure, and so on. This gives you the advantage of being able to execute some of your complex logic closer to the data. You're effectively writing code that sits on the server and can get very, very close to the data. You can take advantage of some of the lower level APIs that we use in order to talk to the data on disk. 
It allows you to execute multiple operations in the context of a single request. So a single invocation of one of your store procedures could effectively invoke lots and lots of operations against the data on disk or actually communicate with other back-end servers before finally returning a response to the client. And again, as Emil mentioned in the keynote this morning, um, with the launch of 3.0 today, uh, Michael Hunger has also released uh, over 100 store procedures. Um, and here's the, the, the kind of GitHub URI for those store procedures. Over 100 different store procedures that kind of exemplify the kinds of things that you can do with this model. And there's some really interesting stuff here. Again, Emil mentioned this morning, there are some store procedures there for introspecting the graph and inferring the, the graph schema and presenting that back as effectively as metadata. Uh, there are store procedures for refactoring the graph. So I don't know if any of you did some of the, the data modeling tutorials yesterday, but as part of that, we often talk about how easy it is to refactor a graph um, and gradually evolve the graph structure over time as new requirements are introduced into the application. Well, again, some of Michael's store procedures make it even easier to refactor large bodies of data. Um, and he's got store procedures there, again, for loading from lots and lots of different back-end data sources. And the example that Emil showed this morning was using a JDBC uh, connector in order to speak to a, a MySQL database and import those results into Neo4j. So this is the, the, the second solutions architecture. You can go with the, the vanilla server and communicate simply using Cypher by way of those drivers. Or you can extend the server and extend the cluster with store procedures and invoke those store procedures using the drivers. The third solutions architecture that you might consider, and this is not so common today, um, is to actually embed Neo4j in your own application. So this takes us back to the beginnings of Neo4j over 10 years ago, when Neo4j wasn't a server product, it was more a library that you would host in your own application. Well, it turns out you can still do that today. As I said, the server product itself uh, wraps an embedded graph database instance. Or you can do something similar. If you're building a desktop app, for example, it may be that you actually want to incorporate the database engine inside of that application. And then we give you access to the Java APIs that allow you to create and query data. You can use Cypher again, but you can also use some of the lower level APIs in order to create your own algorithms and create your own traverses and traversals and so on. So, on. so these are the, the, the three different solutions architectures. Server, server with store procedures, and then embedded. As I say, embedded today is not so common. Typically, people use the server version of the product. Hardware and, uh, and software considerations. Okay, so Neo4j is a database. It loves multiple cores, and it loves lots of RAM. So with regard to CPU, Neo4j will scale with the number of cores. If you're using the community version, we scale up to four cores. If you've got more cores than that on your, on your machines and you want to take advantage of them, then you'll need the enterprise version of Neo4j, which scales beyond four cores. Um, but even the community version scales up to four cores, and that's for both reads and writes. With regard to disk, I mean, we're always making that data durable on disk. Um, we prefer SSD over hard disk, um, and we recommend using SLC, these single-level cell uh, SSDs, rather than the kind of consumer multi-level cell versions that you can get today. Okay, so you'll get better performance if you use SS, SLC with, uh, with SATA rather than using the, the kind of consumer level SSDs. One thing that we do recommend when you're configuring your servers is to increase the number of permitted open files on your instances. So if you're running on uh, some flavor of Unix, you'll know that by default, the number of open file handles you can have is actually very low. It's about 1,024. We recommend upping that using the, the ULimit uh, config to 40,000 or more. And the reason for this is because of Lucene. So we use Lucene as a, a, an index provider. Um, it's incorporated into the product. And Lucene, when it's indexing data, 
produces lots and lots of very small intermediary files, which it then begins to, um, to aggregate. But very quickly, you can end up with lots and lots of open file handles on a machine. So we recommend increasing that permitted number of open file handles to 40,000 or more. Okay, so that's configuration that you can do on each instance. And then RAM, lots and lots of RAM. Okay. Um, once upon a time, we used to have an on-heap cache, and we used to recommend that you would try and get a lot of your data into main memory and into that on-heap cache. Um, we've actually removed that on-heap cache, and now we have an off-heap page cache. Um, so the actual size of the heap that you need to configure isn't as big as it used to be. Um, for large applications, even today, you know, we'd recommend a maximum heap size of about 12 gig. But then it assign lots and lots of the remaining RAM to configuring that off-heap page cache. That's effectively memory-mapped files. All of the store files on disk will be managed by our off-heap page cache. And if you can assign lots and lots of RAM to the page cache, then you'll be maintaining lots of cache data um, available for your queries. So what we recommend is that you explicitly set that uh, page cache size, okay? And I've uh, indicated here the, uh, the config parameter that you can use to set that page cache size. What we recommend is that you set the page cache to about the size of your existing store on disk, plus 10%, plus some headroom for growth. You know, if you're anticipating lots and lots of writes, then obviously you want to increase the size of that page cache quite considerably. Um, if you don't configure it, then by default, we will try and consume, the page cache by default, we'll try and consume about 50% of the available RAM once we've deducted the heap size that you've configured. So you need to configure the heap size, the page cache, and then allow some additional space for the OS and for any other apps that are running on there, any other monitoring tools and things like that. With regard to software, nowadays we qualify with Java 8. Um, and we qualify on OpenJDK and on the Oracle JDK. If you're using Power8, um, Power8's uh, IBM's high-end superscalar multiprocessor platform, um, we also qualify on Power8, and we've worked with IBM um, and with their JDK to qualify on that platform. So again, if you want lots and lots of cores at your disposal, then uh, Power8 offers that opportunity there. But these are the three JDKs that we qualify with today. And by default, with 2.3 2 and with 3.0, um, we configure the G1 garbage collector. Okay, so this gives you predictable pause times, um, whereas in the past, we used to configure the CMS collector by default. If you're using an older version of Neo4j, it's likely by default it's using the CMS collector. But we'd recommend experimenting with the G1 garbage collector, um, as long as you're running on something 1.7071 or after. Um, and then you can use the G1 garbage collector with Neo4j. And there, as I say, you'll exp experience predictable pause times, um, very short pause times, um, and we've discovered that with G1, we tend to get higher throughput and uh, higher stability than we did with the, the CMS garbage collector. Um, so again, this is the configuration parameter that you need to supply if you're running on an older version of Neo, but you want to use that G1 garbage collector. So lots of customers run on their own dedicated hardware, but more and more of them are today running in cloud environments. The one that we're most familiar with and that, that many of our customers are familiar with is running on AWS. Obviously, we have customers who run on Azure um, and run on a number of other different platforms. Um, if you're running in a cloud environment, then you know, a number of things to, to be aware of. Uh, deciding on the kinds of instances that you might want to spin up. With AWS, you can choose compute-optimized instances, so you get lots and lots of uh, CPU capacity. Or you can choose memory-optimized op instances, where you get lots and lots of RAM. And then there are other instances that kind of balance these, these two different parameters. Um, irrespective of the, the kind of instance that you're running, I mean, if you're building a big application, then typically you're, you're wanting to run clustered Neo4j. And therefore, in order to increase your durability guarantees, you should be running clustered Neo4j and running lots and lots of backups. And I'll talk about both of those things in a bit more detail. 
If you're building a cluster in AWS, then again, um, for increased durability, we recommend uh, locating the different instances within that cluster on different availability zones within a region. So the availability zones effectively map to different data centers. Um, and this will give you increased durability. If one of those data centers becomes unavailable, you can still uh, retain a majority of instances in your cluster if they're distributed across those availability zones. Then you've got storage considerations to take account of. Um, and in AWS, we've got uh, two different ways in which we can actually make that data durable on disk. We can use the local storage that actually accompanies each instance, um, or we can use network attached storage. Um, and Amazon actually provide different durability guarantees here. So with the local storage, when that instance disappears, the local storage disappears. Okay, you turn that machine off, or you turn that instance off, or it fails for some other reason, then effectively that local storage also goes away. Whereas with the network attached storage, with the uh, EBS volumes, the physical machine, inst well, the, the, the machine can disappear, but the network attached storage is made more durable and is available within uh, that region to be attached to another instance. Okay. You're going to get by far the best performance using the local storage. And again, if you're running clustered Neo4j, then effectively it's the clustering, uh, the, the HA clustering on our part, that's going to provide the durability that you need. Okay. So actually the recommendation here is probably consider local storage with clustered Neo4j and with daily backups, and that's going to give you the, the majority of the durability requirements that you need. If you do choose EBS, these, these network attached volumes, then you have to be aware of um, the additional I.O. overhead of actually writing to those volumes. So there you can actually guarantee or provision a certain amount of I.O. bandwidth. Um, and I've given some of the details here, but effectively, if you're using EBS volumes, then you should have EBS-optimized instances and provisioning the required I.O. bandwidth that you need for your read and write operations. Okay, so that's the hardware and software requirements. Now we'll look a little bit at the, the HA architecture itself. So today, Neo4j uh, in its clustered state is a traditional master-slave setup where we have an instance. Here we have a, a cluster of three instances. One of those instances at any point in time will be acting as the master and coordinating all of the writes to the cluster. And the remaining instances will be in the role of slaves and they'll be polling the master at frequent interval intervals in order to pull transactions across and to catch up with the master. Okay. So we have two different protocols going on here. We have uh, a cluster management protocol where the instances in the cluster agree between them who at any point in time is the master and which of the remaining instances are slaves. And then we have a transaction propagation protocol where all of those slaves were effectively pulling the most recent transactions over and updating their own copy of the store. So every machine in that cluster will have a full copy of the data set. We don't distribute the data set across the cluster. Every instance in that cluster will have a full <coughs> copy of the data set. If your client or your application writes directly to the master, then by the time the control <coughs> returns to the client, we've made that data durable on disk, and it's immediately consistent with regard to the client. <coughs> However, the overall cluster is eventually consistent within the order of several milliseconds. So remember, you've got the slaves that are polling the master at frequent intervals in order to catch up. So there's a potential, um, you write to the master, that transaction is then propagated, or that write is then propagated um, over the course of several milliseconds. If you're reading from a slave, it may be that you're reading some, effectively some stale state We've got an eventually consistent system. Some configuration options to consider um, when we're, we're configuring the cluster. Um, probably the most important configuration parameter here is this one, HA initial hosts. So the value of this, the value of the initial hosts parameter, is a list of 
the addresses of other instances in the cluster. When we introduce a new instance into the cluster, a new machine into the cluster, we need to provide it with the address of at least one existing machine that it can contact in order to discover everything else in the cluster. So that's the value of that initial host's parameter. So we could provide it with a single address or we could provide it with a comma-separated uh, list of or addresses of other machines in the cluster. Okay. And then when our new instance joins, it will contact each of those instances that it knows about through the initial hosts in order to discover the entire topology of the cluster. So the important point here is that um, when we're joining the cluster, when the new instance is joining the cluster, all of the instances that we've listed as part of that parameter have to be available at that point in time. If one of them isn't available, or if you know, more than one of them isn't available, then our new instance won't be able to join. So a good recommendation here is to keep that list relatively small. Even if you've got a very large cluster, perhaps you know, 15 or 45 instances or something like that, the actual initial host's value should be relatively small, perhaps no more than three or five addresses. Okay. Because this is only used at startup time. Once we've started up, once the new instance has joined, it will then discover the rest of the topology by connecting to each of those instances. Other configuration parameters to be aware of um, are the, the transaction propagation uh, parameters here. So we've got this pull interval which uh, I've set in the example here to be 10 seconds. This is the interval that slaves are going to use for polling the master. Um, you might want to dial that down to be a matter of milliseconds rather than seconds. By default, that's actually switched off. So if you're configuring a cluster, you do want to configure this parameter. You need to set it to something other than zero. Okay. But this is the interval that the slaves are going to use to poll the master in order to, to drag across those new transactions. You can also specify this push factor, um, which has a default value of 1. And this push factor applies to the master. When we're writing to the master, the master, at the point in time when it's, it's uh, making the data durable on its own disk, it will also try and push that transaction out to as many instances as you supplied in this parameter here. Um, this is not guaranteed delivery. This is just best efforts delivery. So if we said, um, you know, I want to push out to three other instances in the cluster, and the master at the point when it's committing this transaction can't actually contact three instances, it's still going to continue. It's still going to make data durable on its own disk and return control to the client. So this is only best efforts uh, delivery of those, those transactions. And then finally, there's some tuning parameters. There are lots and lots of other HA parameters that are available in the manual. These are just some of the more interesting ones that it's worth knowing about. Uh, the tuning parameters that I've pointed out here uh, relate to heartbeats. So all of those instances in the cluster as part of the, the cluster management protocol are sending heartbeats to one another. By default, they're sending heartbeats every five seconds. So the heartbeat time out here, um, we typically configure to be twice the duration of the, the heartbeats plus a little extra. Um, so by default, it's 11 seconds. If after 11 seconds, we haven't seen a heartbeat from another instance in the cluster, then we will mark that as potentially um, failing or failed. Okay. So um, if instances in your cluster are experiencing long pauses, if for some reason um, you're experiencing long GC pauses, and ideally we'd want to go and tune that to eliminate those GC pauses. But if you are experiencing long GC pauses, then it may be you're disrupting that heartbeat life cycle. Um, and some of those heartbeats are going to be sent out uh, after five seconds. You know, we're going to delay sending them by more than five seconds or so. So in those cases, we may see uh, situations where the cluster begins to transfer mastership from one instance to another. We kind of roll that mastership over. If you're seeing that happening a lot, then it's worth increasing this heartbeat timeout. The downside of that is that we're not actually going to discover when something really has failed until that timeout has elapsed. OK, so there are some trade-offs here. The roll switch timeout here relates more to when we're starting up a new instance. And if we're introducing a new instance into an existing cluster, and that instance is having to pull across the entire data set from the master, then it's going to take quite a while to pull that across.
and apply it before it can become a, a legitimate member of the cluster. Um, we have a, a default of two minutes. If after two minutes it doesn't have the full data set, then it's going to be marked as failed. Um, but again, you can increase that timeout limit perhaps to five or ten minutes if you've got a very, very large data set. So you can bring new instances online um, and we won't consider them failed after two minutes or so. So once you've got a cluster up and running, there are a number of different metrics um, and different bits of information that you can take advantage of within your application and within your monitoring and your other tooling in order to, to, to understand the state and the health of that cluster. So the most important thing here are these HA role endpoints. So every instance in the cluster can be contacted over three different URIs in order to, to tell you something about its current role. Remember, this is a traditional master-slave setup where one of those machines will be a, a master and the other instances will be uh, acting as slaves. We, can, um, we expose that state over these three different URIs. And you can pull these URIs in order to discover, well, are you the master or are you a slave? Okay, so you can issue HTTP GET requests against each of these URIs. And I've indicated the status codes that each of them will return. Um, and effectively, by polling one or more of these URIs per instance in the cluster, you should be able to determine which instance is the master and which are the slaves. This is particularly useful for load balancing software where you're wanting to distribute or send all of the rights to the master, the current master in the cluster, and you want to load balance the remaining reads across the entire cluster. You need to know who's the master and which are the slaves. Okay. Now, I've also included this additional little uh, configuration parameter here. So if you're securing Neo4j, if you've switched security on or, or authentication and authorization on, then these URIs will also be secured which would require your load balancing software to know some credentials in order to be able to make uh, uh, basic authentication requests to these URIs. Many people think that's a, you know, unnecessary overhead. As far as their load balancing is concerned, all, all they want to do is, is know who's the master, who's the slave. And they want to be able to poll these URIs. They don't really want to have to take account of the security implications there. So for these three URIs and nothing else over the product surface, you can turn off um, authentication using that config parameter. And that simplifies uh, deployment and operations. Okay. All right, we also expose lots of additional monitoring information via this JMX endpoint. Um, you can pull that and get back some very detailed JSON documents that describe the entire state. Well, describe the state of this instance and its view of the remaining cluster. I've kind of <laughs> really hit the time limit, actually. Um, so we're, we haven't actually gone on to any of the, the monitoring or the backup stuff. Um, the, the slides are actually pretty self-explanatory. So you'll be able to download them shortly at the end of the day um, and get details of them. But towards the end here, we detail in, you know, lots of the, uh, the monitoring um, and some of the testing strategies that we employ. Um, but thank you very much for coming along. and hope you enjoyed the rest of the day.